Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them, and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, The Manager's Deception, Outwitting the Entitled Karen for a Last Minute Passport Drama. The second story, a doctor's unconventional Christmas present empowers office staff to fire rude patients. The third story, when these geniuses fired the wrong people, the company was swallowed up in chaos. The first story is, Ma'am, I am the manager. For some context, the place I used to work at was in the city, near Broadway and the Empire State Building, a very tourist-heavy area. My job dealt with important documents, fingerprints, visas, expedited information, and other boring crap. We usually had big shot clients, celebrities, athletes of all kinds, and city elites show up for our services. Most of them are pretty entitled, and with good reason. This all went down Friday after a long day of BS. It was almost closing time and the office was empty except for me and a fellow co-worker and good friend. The majority of our appointments were done or no-shows, except for the last three, 4.50, 5 o'clock, and 5.10. So me and my co-worker were cleaning up and BSing so we could leave at 5.20 at the most. It was almost 5 o'clock and it seemed no one else was going to show up. We had everything cleaned up and ready to GTFO. That's when EM and her child show up. SH, so close. This lady looked just like your stereotypical Karen, that iconic haircut, Big earrings, middle-aged, expensive handbag, shades, even though it's cloudy outside, blonde dyed hair and most likely in a struggling marriage. She walks into the office and heads straight to our reception counter. Her son follows in and takes a seat in the empty waiting room. He looks to 8, maybe 10. CW, co-worker. Hello, how can I help you today? EM. Yeah, I'm here for a 5 o'clock appointment. CW. Sure. I'm just going to need to see your ID and your method of payment. And may I ask what are you here for? We knew there was only one 5 o'clock appointment, but we still ask for IDs just to be safe. And we also ask our clients what they're here for, since we only have their name and appointment time. They have to let us know what they need to get done. EM hands over her ID and credit card. I don't know what I'm here for. My boss made the appointment for me and said just to show up on time. CW confirms that she's the legit 5 o'clock client. Sorry ma'am, I can't really help you if you don't know what you're here for. What job is it for? This happens far too often for my liking. People showing up with appointments they scheduled and planned after a two month waiting list, only to show up and not know what it's for. It basically turns into a detective game of us trying to figure out what they need. If not, they risk paying for the wrong service and having to come back again. EM. I don't know, sheesh. Aren't you guys supposed to know? I'm probably here for my visa to Israel. CW. Probably. Why don't you call your boss and ask? EM rolls her eyes and pulls out her phone. During this time, I look at her ID and her credit card. It's one of those black Azure cards big shots have. Made out of real metal and SH. She's obviously rolling in serious dough. EM steps off to the side while on the phone speaking with her boss. I glance over at her kid who's seated and hasn't said a word this whole time. He has his school bag on and looks melancholy and is staring at our TV, which is on Fox News or some garbage. He proceeds to open his bag and take out toys. I immediately recognize them. They're Pokemon and a Spider-Man figure. Man of culture, I see, I think to myself as I grin, reminiscing about my own childhood. So then five minutes pass or so and this lady is still on the phone, arguing and pacing. I literally have my coat on. As soon as we're done with this chick, we're out of here. That's when someone else enters the office, a tall, handsome guy, a real 9 out of 10. I immediately stand from my chair and tell my coworker I got this. Me. Hello? How can I help you? Guy. Yeah, hi. I'm here for a so-and-so. I got a bit lost and my appointment was at 4.30. Me. No worries. I'll take you now. I'll need your ID and your method of payment. You can also follow me. I take the guy to one of our cubicles and fill out the paperwork and help him with whatever needs to be done. At the same time, my coworker is still in the front arguing with entitled mom, who seems to be still on the phone. I'm making small talk with this guy, 
but also listening to the conversation up in the front. My coworker is still somewhat of a newbie and might need help. I'm almost done with my client when I hear EM getting heated and yelling. I'm here for a visa. I was told to come here at 5. I was never told I needed to bring my passport too. CW. Sorry ma'am, I can't help you if you don't have your passport with you. Do you have a birth certificate or a marriage certificate? Then maybe we can help you. EM. No, I didn't bring those either. I'm divorced. Good grief, I think to myself. She's probably sapping her ex-husband's money through child support and alimony. Poor guy. I finish up quickly with the 9 out of 10 guy and send him off. I head back to the front desk to see what's up. My coworker gives me the rundown. EM needs a visa for Israel, which requires additional steps and procedures. She can't come back another day with her passport because she has a flight soon or something. In this situation, we literally can't help her, which is what my coworker is trying to explain. But we also can't just send her away. If my boss found out we denied a big shot client, he'll have our heads on a plate. EM. When do you close today? Me. I look at the clock. Now? EM. I don't live far from here. Can I leave my son and come back? I'll be quick. Me. Sorry, ma'am. We close now, but you can come in first thing Monday morning. We can reserve a spot. I really don't want to stay here another minute, and on top of that have to babysit some kid I just met. I'll have to explain to my boss why we sent her away, probably get chewed out a bit, but I don't give an F. What can we do? She has no passport. Me and CW have plans, go out and open cold ones with the boys. We can't just sit here for who knows how long. Not happening. EM. Then why did you help the young man first? He came in after me, and you helped him quick. She points at me with a wide-eyed glance. Me. That's true, but he knew what he was here for and had the appropriate documentation. Sadly, you don't. EM. How was I supposed to know? I leave Sunday, diet. Me and my coworker look at each other. This bee has lost it. Meanwhile, the kid in the back is still seated, unfazed by his mother. Poor kid probably is so used to her outburst and shenanigans. I gotta get her out of here. This is stupid, I think to myself. I'm sorry, there's not much more we can do. E.M. Huffing looks around the office. Let me speak with your manager. Is he here? I spoke with him earlier. Or are only you teenagers running this place? She wasn't here, but E.M. didn't need to know that. She most likely spoke with our actual boss. He usually gets in personal contact with money bag clients, probably to grease his hands. I look over at my coworker with a grin. He looks at me confused. Me, ma'am, I am the manager. My coworker and I had a serious poker face. He knew I was full of SH. I wasn't even the assistant manager. The EM scans me up and down. I thought she was going to call out my bluff, but she didn't. EM, give me my things, I'm leaving. She collected her stuff and called her son over, who put his Pokemon away and stood by the door. We handed back her things and she spun around in a huff and walked away only to turn around and grab her Starbucks coffee she had forgotten. EM. I'm gonna give this place a horrible review. Me. Have a good evening, ma'am. You're always welcome back. Sure enough, not long after, she gave us a poor review on Yelp. The second story is... A doctor's best Christmas present to his office staff. Fire a patient who is rude to you. Several years ago, I was chief operating officer of a mid-sized acute care hospital in a prosperous suburb of a major metropolitan area in the deep south of the USA. I am now retired. One of the things you have to do when you're in the hospital management biz is to schmooze with the doctors. So for 30 to 60 minutes a day, I would hang around the doctor's private dining room or other places where they would go when they needed a break and listen to what they had to say. Doctors like to talk about themselves, so my opinion was rarely requested and even more rarely provided. Some were good docs, some were bad. But one that stood out was a board-certified internist who I'll call Dr. G. Dr. G was 60-plus years old, fiercely independent, and was one of the few solo doctors who admitted patients to our hospital. Most of our doctors were in large multi-specialty group practices. Not him, he was by himself. Dr. G had more business than he could handle. Not only did he have a huge patient base because he'd been practicing for decades, he was a D-good doctor. So many of the hospital's other doctors referred a constant stream of patients to him. Dr. G didn't need money. His wife was an anesthesiologist. They already had a huge house, an equally huge vacation house, several cars and no debt. Their children were grown. He never told me how much retirement money they had, but he hinted that it was a buttload of stocks and mutual funds. 
He was working because he wanted to, not because he had to. His office was only open four days a week, Monday through Thursday. He had hired twice the number of nurses, bookkeepers, secretaries, etc. that he needed to run it. So nobody was overworked or overstressed. One day during the Christmas season, the docs were sitting around the private dining room talking about what they were giving their office staffs for Christmas. The gifts ranged from tacky, new office uniforms, to useless, prepaid detail at a local car wash for the cars of nurses and secretaries who were paid so poorly that they all drove rust buckets, to practical and thoughtful, gift certificates to discount chain stores. Everyone had to admit, however, that Dr. G's Christmas gift was the best. Even though he gave each employee a certificate that was in the low four figures, that was not his best gift, not by a long shot. It was Dr. G's other gift that got everyone's attention. Every Christmas, each one of his office employees got to fire one patient, no questions asked. It did not matter who the patient was or what they had done to the employee, they were out. The employee didn't even have to say why, although they usually enjoyed making sure the rest of the staff and Dr. G all knew why. There were some limitations and exceptions. For example, if the patient was in the middle of a crisis where continuity of care was essential, such as during or shortly after hospitalization, Dr. G promised the employee a rain check that the patient would be fired as soon as it could be done without compromising their medical treatment. Also, a patient could never be fired if they were terminally ill. I think there might have been a few other exceptions, such as patients with severe dementia. I just can't recall them all. The staff understood that they could not fire patients who were so sick that they couldn't keep themselves from behaving the way that they did. They could only fire patients who were capable of acting like decent human beings, but chose to be a-holes. This was never a problem because there were always plenty of those. When a patient was fired, Dr. G would send a polite personal letter to the patient, informing them that he is limiting his practice and they were no longer within the scope of the patients that he would treat. This was actually true, although his letters didn't say so because medical science has no cure for being an a-hole. His office would be glad to forward a copy of the patient's medical records to any other doctor's office, free of charge. He did not suggest any other doctor because after all, these were bad patients. If the patient had a small balance on their bill, Dr. G's letter would tell the patient that he was writing it off. He continued to use his normal procedures to collect large balances. His staff would also flag the patient in their office systems and records, so that current and future office staff would know to never let that patient come back, ever. That's it. He had eight to 10 employees and he could easily afford to do without eight to 10 patients out of the thousands that he treated every year. So all year long, every time a patient was rude to one of his office staff, the staff person could think, in a few months, I'll never have to put up with your crap ever again. Dr. G said that it was the best morale booster he had ever used with his staff, got rid of patients that he himself did not want to treat and cost him practically nothing. Many, not all, doctors are complete idiots when it comes to hiring and managing their own employees. They hire as cheaply as they can and are completely oblivious to the fact that you get what you pay for. Side note, Dr. G realized that one, you don't have to pay twice as much to get an employee who is twice as effective. Usually 10 to 20% over the average mean does it for you. Two, work environment and leadership are at least as important as the amount you pay in salaries and benefits. And those things usually cost very little, except you have to give up a lot of ego and do things like listen to what your employees are telling you and assume that they are smart enough to know and do their jobs, things which are de-near impossible for some doctors. MD equals minor deity. And the last story is, when the wrong people were fired. Worked for a government contractor. Government agencies require lots of reports. One of our best customer agencies required weekly progress reports on each project we were doing for them. It's extra work, but the agency paid as well, and their checks were always on time and never bounced. This had been going on long enough that our upper management just got complacent and treated it as guaranteed income. Unfortunately, our upper management was not good. When the economy took a dip and our revenue dipped with it, the first thing management did was lay off employees. They did not evaluate the value of those employees. They mainly laid off people who were not part of the management cliques. They laid off the people who researched, prepared, and submitted those reports. Because the contracts required those reports and the reports stopped, the agency stopped paying. Management didn't seem to realize or care until that agency told them it was auditing the contract. Cue the sudden chaos and CYA attempts. None of it worked. We were clearly in violation of the contract terms and the agency terminated its contracts with us. It wasn't a big enough financial hit to kill off the company, 
but its effects were definitely felt. Management responded by laying off more people than it should have kept, ended up getting another contract terminated early due to non-performance. These genius managers managed to bankrupt the company after about five years. How did they get away with it? They were relatives, mostly kids of the owner, and friends of those kids. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Have a good day.